Hello, this is a video to review the data analysis for experiment three, the calorimetry experiment. So in this experiment, our basic introduction is that we can combust compounds in the presence of an excess of oxygen. We generate, of course, CO2 and water. We can imagine balancing a reaction such as that for the reaction naphthalene. If we want to combust an unknown, generally what we're going to want to do is begin with a known compound so we can standardize our calorimeter and determine what we call the water equivalent for the calorimeter. So our basic experiment begins with benzoic acid as our standardization material. We're provided with the enthalpy of combustion um, relatively precisely for uh, benzoic acid, minus 26,425 plus or minus 0 0.002 kJs per gram. So that's the known enthalpy of combustion of benzoic acid. So for benzoic acid, we begin with this particular value here as the quantity that we know, so we can try to solve for our water equivalent. Now, there's a series of data that we need to determine, like we see our TA, TB, TC, A, B, and C, and some other values here. So let's talk about what those values correspond to. So let's begin actually by taking a peek at the data you actually collect in this experiment. Um, so you collected data by looking at the temperature of a water bath. You had some time where you were looking at the temperature of the water before you detonate. Generally speaking, this temperature here will be increasing. The question is, where is room temperature? Room temperature, let's assume it's in the middle of where we begin our experiment. So before we detonate our sample, our temperature is going up a little bit because the calorimeter is not perfect, and it's simply increasing towards room temperature. Then we combust our sample, and if the temperature of the water bath increases a couple of degrees C, perhaps goes above room temperature. Now this all depends on where our water bath temperature was set, so we kind of have an idea of where this temperature is, where room temperature happens to lie, and then where the final temperature lies. So it's possible room temperature could be below where we begin. That would be a pretty cold room usually, since our water bath's usually at about 20 degrees C. Um, and then um, usually, or it's even possible that the room temperature could be above our final temperature. Now, the reason why this matters is you may or may not pick up this decreasing slope here. If you don't see a decrease in your slope, once you reach kind of what appears to be a maximum or once your temperature is starting to asymptote, if it doesn't begin to start dropping, that's probably because room temperature is above our final temperature. Now, it doesn't particularly matter where room temperature is. It just gives you a sense if you should expect to see a positive slope or a negative slope or both of them be positive or both of them be negative. But the point here is that from this temperature curve, we want to somehow try to be able to determine what the delta T is, what the change of temperature is. Now, mathematically, what we're going to do is we're going to try to um, come to this realization that had we not detonated at point A, if we never detonated here, the temperature, temperature of our bath would have continued to increase. And we can pick up that increase just by looking at the slope before we detonate and following that slope um, with a linear regression. Likewise, um, when we see the downward slope, if it is downward, or whatever the sloping change is, um, once we finish um, our trial, we can use that slope to kind of gear that temperature back to where the maximum temperature would have been at some other moment in time. Because ultimately, you know, and even if we step back for a moment and think, okay, like what if we had a perfect calorimeter? If we had a perfect calorimeter, then you would see just a flat temperature, then an increase may take some time for it to increase, and then you'd have another flat temperature once it peaked out. And then you could just simply look and say, okay, what's the temperature here? What's the temperature there? Take the difference. That would be your delta T. Essentially, what we're doing is we're saying, well, let's try to pick up this slope here. Let's pick up this slope here since it's probably going to be increasing before we detonate, decrease after we detonate, and then at some moment in time, take that difference to be our delta T. So it's looking pretty sloppy here. Um, but our delta T is the change in temperature that we would have observed at the time at which it took to reach 60% of our temperature rise. That's a mouthful. We'll look at this in terms of an equation. But we're going to look at point C and point A. Uh, point, point A is the point at which we detonate. You can usually know that pretty well. If you're recording your notebook, the precise number of seconds you were into your trial when you detonated. So it's really easy to know where point A is. Point C, um, it could be the maximum. That's the easiest way to determine it if you see this downward slope, is just to look for the maximum temperature. You can do that just in Excel, look, like uh, take your uh, series of data and try to find the maximum temperature. You could just look for it manually as well. If you don't see a maximum, it's just going to be a point at which the temperature is leveled off 
And at which point afterwards, it appears that the increase is only due to the temperature of the bath trying to reach room temperature. If you choose point C too early, the temperature is rising here just because the temperature hasn't quite leaked fully out of the water bath yet. So you have to make sure point C is at a point at which the temperature is leveled off, ideally decreasing afterwards. It all has to do with where room temperature is, of course. Okay, so what we would do is determine our points A and C that way, and then point B is going to be determined by the time it takes to reach 60% of that temperature difference. So we're going to take like the temperature at point A, temperature at point C, so actually the temperature at point C minus the temperature at point A. We're going to say, okay, what's the difference in temperature with those two temperatures? What's 60% of that difference? And then at what point does it take to reach 60% of that temperature rise? That's where we're going to be propagating um, using equation our pre-fire rise, our post-fire change in temperature to determine our delta T at that moment in time here. So essentially what you're trying to say is from the change in temperature after your run, what would the maximum point have been at that 60% mark? And then likewise, if we had never detonated, the temperature would have continued increasing. So let's propagate that temperature up to that moment in time. Okay, so let's set up a crude uh, trial. So let's say we recorded this data here. And let's just say we detonate here, this is our point A, and that we have in our notebook that this was at 200 seconds. There's going to be a degree symbol there, just 200 seconds is when we hit the detonation. And then that was at, let's say, 24.0 degrees C. And then let's say we're leveling off around here. And let's say that that's at, I don't know, let's say 1,200 seconds. And then that that was at 27.0 degrees C. Okay, so this is our point C. Okay, so A is the time of firing. So a would be 200 seconds. C is the time at the beginning of the period after the temperature rise, which the rate of temperature changes become constant. So this is looking at your data, it's increasing, increasing, and then after this point, the change should be constant, either down or up. Um, but look at your entire data set. If eventually it's going down, then use point C to be the maximum in the data afterwards. Now, if you look here, the change is not constant. This is still increasing as the heat, uh, if you imagine the experiment, you have the bombs hot, so it takes some time for the heat to leak out of the bomb into the water bath where we're measuring the temperature. So point C would be 1200 seconds. Okay, and so then what we're gonna wanna do is take the difference here of point A and point C, so that's three degrees. So the time when the temperature rises 60% of the total rise, I'd have to look at my crude difference of about three degrees. I'd have to multiply that by 60%. So that's going to be 1.8 degrees C. So the time it takes us to reach 60% of the rise would be the time it takes us to get up to 25.8 degrees C. So we'd be looking for, now it's gonna be hard to tell without division markings, but if we're about 60%, it's probably about this point here, would be 25.8 degrees C. What I'd want to do is just go into my data where I have all these data points and then just go look for the time at which the temperature was about 25.8 degrees C and then read off that time here as point B. Okay, so let's say that that's 650 seconds is what time corresponds to reaching that point. So let's say that's what well, I look at my data. I determined that to be 650 seconds. The key is that points A, B, and C are all the time points. So all the time of the firing, time where the temperature rises leveled off, and the time at, reach, uh, the time at which point we've reached 60% of the rise. Now TA is the temperature at the time of firing. So TA um, is the temperature, so that'd be 24.0 degrees C. Temperature at point C would be 27.0 degrees C. They don't ask you for TB here in the manual, but TB is important because that's how we determine point B. So I call this TB. And even I don't think I ask you to determine TB in the handout, but you kind of need to figure out what TB is so you can figure out what the time at point B is. Um, R1 and R2 are our pre-fire and our post-fire rates of change. So what we'd want to do is go before point A, for about 60 seconds. We don't need to use all the data. We just need to pick out about 60 seconds. It should be linear. If it's not linear, 
we either need to expand or reduce the amount of time we're using to get that slope. Same thing for point C. We're going to go right after it for about 60 seconds. Um, you could go smaller or longer depending on what's linear. If this entire region is linear, it doesn't make a difference, right? You're going to get the same, same slope or very similar slope. Um, now, you could use Linus. We could briefly talk about data or the uh, error analysis in a later video. But if you use Linus, you can get the uncertainties in your slope parameters. That's really what we're going to need later for the error analysis. Okay, so we determine R1 and R2. You can just look at your curve, select your data, add it at, like the easiest way to do this in Excel would be you have your data series added in with a nice plot, and then you just go select this data separately, add it to the plot. You won't notice it because it's the exact same data that's already there, and then you can select that series there and do the linear regression. You can even extrapolate the linear regression so you can kind of see where it's heading. You can do the same thing for this series here. Now again, I would use 60 seconds before A and after C as my general rule of thumb, you can expand or contract that amount of time as you need to to get a linear curve. Now, if you go too far back for A, what you're gonna end up seeing is just a little bit of an upward curve. So you usually just wanna use 30 to 60 seconds before point A, same thing with after point C. Okay, and so then we ask you to do a titration with, um, um, I think it's sodium carbonate, and we make it up with a very specific concentration so that all you need to do is figure out how many milliliters of that solution was needed to titrate. This is titrating for the presence of nitric acid. Nitric acid is formed when nitrogen is present inside the bomb calorimeter because there's a reaction that occurs between nitrogen, oxygen, and water vapor to produce HNO3. And the only way that this forms is if N2 is either present in the uh, bomb calorimeter due to residual N2 from air, or due to nitrogen being present in our oxygen sample and the gas cylinder, or due to nitrogen being present as an impurity or um, an element in the compound that we're combusting. We're combusting benzoic acid and naphthalene here, so you really shouldn't see an appreciable amount of base needed to titrate for, N for nitrogen in the compound that you're combusting. Um, also, usually our O2 sample is pretty pure, and we've usually not had too big of an issue with nitrogen being present in the calorimeter. Usually what we say is if you have uh, recorded one milliliter or less for a given compound or sample, then you can go ahead and ignore that from the calculation and also um, from future experiments. So if you find that it takes you know half a milliliter of um, the base solution for benzoic acid, for your second trial, go ahead and skip it. Nevertheless, um, however many milliliters it takes would be C1. Sulfur in the sample, that's only if we have sulfur as one of the elements in the compound that we're combusting, so we're gonna, going to ignore that term. C3, um, this is mentioned somewhere in the handout to assume that this is five centimeters. So we're just going to assume that we burn five centimeters of wire. Oops. Um, and this is because this is a really hard quantity to measure. The wire tends to beat up into a ball anyway, so it's really hard to measure the length of wire that actually burned. Um, so we're just going to assume that we start with 10. So what I would recommend is every time you make your sample, you have your wire leading to it. Try to have a similar amount of wire hanging over the leads. And then uh, that you always use 10 centimeters. And then you assume about half of it's going to combust. And if you're just careful and consistent, that'll probably work out to be pretty true. So then finally at the end, we can calculate T. The manual uses T here. I like to think it was a delta T because you're calculating like the change in temperature before and after the trial, but delta T or little t would be the temperature at point C minus the temperature at point A and then minus R1, B minus A. So these are the times here. And then minus R2, that post-fire change of temperature, C minus B. Only thing I want to say is if R1 or R2 have a sign, keep the sign. So if R1 is negative, then keep R1 as being negative. So it be TC minus TA, then it really ends up being plus R1. Um, but you know, keep the sign in for R1 and R2 if they happen to be negative, um, and just keep the minus sign here as well. So don't worry about the uh, arithmetic too much. Just do the arithmetic as indicated, keeping the signs on R1 and R2 as you determine them from your linear regressions. Okay, and so then um, two other terms, W is the water equivalent, um, it's part of the standardization process, and M is the mass of the sample. So we'll talk about those in a moment.
Okay, so our enthalpy of combustion and quantity of uh, kJs per gram can be given by taking the temperature rise times the water equivalent, and then here's where we factor in the E1, E2, and the E3. So remember, E2 is the sulfur term. We're assuming that that one's zero. Our E1, probably going to be pretty small. E3, five centimeters of wire being combusted, M, the mass of the sample that was combusted. So what we're doing with benzoic acid is we know H, we don't know W, we can figure out what T is, and we'll measure the mass of the sample that had combusted. Uh, really basic, but you know, you have your little cells, your benzoic acid sample in it. I would take the mass before you combust it. I mean, it seems obvious what, what other mass would you take. But sometimes you might take the mass of the cell after you combust the sample. Problem is the wire has a tendency to beat up and then fall into the cell. So sometimes after you do the experiment, you see a little bead of, of melted wire that falls into the cell. You want to make sure that somehow that that mass isn't coming into your equation. So I would just take a mass of your cell before the trial, add your benzoic acid, before the trial, take that difference of mass before the trial, that's what the M term would be recorded as in terms of the mass of the sample that was combusted. Okay, and so you could have your A, B, C, T, A, T, C, R1, R2, you have your um, correction terms, and then you have the uh, water equivalent of calorimeter that you can determine from there so you can solve what H is equal to. So the standardization process is you solve for W, given H, you find out what T is, you know what the mass of the sample was with your two correction terms, and you can then standardize the calorimeter, and then you can go back afterwards, and once you know W, you can then solve for an unknown enthalpy of combustion of the compound. A quick note on some of the errors here. So the, um, whoops, um, the um, calorimeter uh, manufacturer provides these approximations. So if you combust a sample that's a gram that has a temperature rise of 2.8 degrees C, uh, leading to an energy equivalent of 2,400 uh, 2, calories uh, per degree C, so that if you make an error in the measurement of the acid to titrate the present due to the titration, an error of one milliliter leads to a 1.0 calorie error. One centimeter error in mass leads to 2.3 calories, an error in one gram of um, water, so like a, an, an error of about plus or minus one milliliter in the volume of water that you add to the calorimeter introduces an error of about three calories. An error of one milligram in the sample leads to an error of about 6.7 calories, and then an error for every 0 0.002 degree C and measuring the temperature rise corresponds to 4.8 calories of error. So if all these errors happen to be in the same direction, that will lead to an error of 17.6 calories on this value of 2,400 calories per degree C. And so that error is um, when we consider that one calorie is uh, 4.184 joules, or excuse me, that the 4.184 joules is a calorie, that, that corresponds to about 80 joules uh, per degree C. Now, the key is that all these errors may not be in the same direction. You don't even have to make all these errors. You know, So we have ways of reducing the errors of the titration. Uh, we use a burette. You can obviously get much closer than one milliliter of error. We use um, the approximation that five centimeters of wire burned. That's because this is going to be a hard to measure quantity. So we'll just assume the same length burns every time. That'll help us um, from, from making an error there. Um, we have um, a, the water bath system that ought to be able to get us much closer than plus or minus one milliliter in terms of the delivery of water. So we have a very expensive water system to help us out and reduce this probably according to the water, um, uh, the instructions in the manual for the, the water system, we get about plus or minus 0.3 mils on the water. And then the uh, sample, then a milligram, it's easy to get that mass. Of course, impurities kind of come into play. But, um, but I think we're pretty good in terms of benzoic acid being pretty pure. And then our temperature technique, as long as we don't make a mistake in the calculations, which really is a difference than what this is talking about. This is like talking about an error in the, um, 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 you know, the thermometer's ability to record temperature as opposed to our making a mistake. But as long as we are careful with our calculations, we should be able to get within that degree of precision with our thermometer. So we should be really 
pretty small in terms of our errors here in this experiment if we conduct the experiment as well as possible. Okay, so that's a brief introduction, maybe slightly not brief introduction, but that is an introduction to the data analysis for the calorimetry experiment. I hope this gives you a good start on working with your data on this lab.